Okay, let's begin the chapter on geothermal energy. Geothermal energy is energy from the earth. So traditionally, geothermal energy has been viewed as harvesting energy whose sources lie deep within the earth. But in recent years, use of ground source heat pumps um, which use soil as a reservoir, has also become common. At the center of the earth is a molten inner core surrounded by an outer core. An inner mantle surrounds the outer core. Then you have the lithosphere, which is a thin, rigid crust that serves as the outermost mantle. And the lithosphere itself is fractured into tectonic plates, 12 large ones and a number of small ones. Uh, this figure from your book illustrates the major plates and the boundaries where the plates move apart. Pools of molten rock magma, rock magma rise leading to volcanic activity. So where the plates collide, one, one plate typically, typically moves underneath the other a process called subduction. Uh, in the subduction zone, temperatures become high enough to melt rock, and seismic and volcanic activities are common in these areas. So, geothermal sources themselves are extensive because the center of the Earth is uh, has uh, high temperatures, and those high temperatures are maintained throughout a good portion um, of the diameter of the Earth, but they're hard to access. Um, geothermal itself is classified by thermal and compositional characteristics. So the, there's typically four different areas. One is called hydrothermal or geohydrothermal. There's also geopressurized magma and enhanced geothermal systems. So they're basically, there are different harvesting strategies are required for these different classes of geothermal resources. Starting off with hydrothermal, hydrothermal um, water is heated or evaporated by direct contact with hot porous rock. So hydrothermal systems that produce steam are labeled as vapor dominant. Hydrothermal systems that produce hot water or a mixture of hot water and steam are called liquid dominant. Energy from hydrothermal sources can be harvested pretty easily. There's many existing geothermal power plants are associated with, hydro, with hydrothermal uh, systems. Um, something to note that rock formations with hydrothermal characteristics are rare, and hydrothermal resources are the most limited of the four categories. Next category would be geopressurized. Geopressurized resources are associated with sediment-filled reservoirs that contain hot water, confined under pressure is much greater than hydrostatic. The fluids contained in geopressurized systems are in temperatures ranging from 150 Celsius to 180 Celsius and may have pressures up to 600 bar, which is about 9,000 PSI. In many geopressurized systems, the hot water may also contain methane in the solution as well as very high levels of dissolved solids, up to 10, 100,000 parts per million. Um, these brine solutions are both highly corrosive and difficult to handle. Then there's um, magma. Magma is molten rock, and at accessible depths, is it's contained in pools under active volcanoes. Magma temperatures are typically in excess of 650 degrees Celsius, making it very attractive from a resource standpoint. And then uh, finally, there's uh, hot dry rock, which is abbreviated HDR. Um, this is cycle as a geothermal resource is characterized by temperatures in excess of 200 degrees Celsius. But as the name implies, is little in the way of naturally contained liquids. Recently, HDR systems have been referred to as enhanced geothermal systems. And the basic idea behind harvesting energy from EGS resources is to inject water under pressure to fracture the rock and use the steam formed from the injected water to drive a turbine to generate electricity. 
So how do you utilize all this available energy or how has it been utilized? So here's some geothermal estimates in terms of uh, what we have in the U.S. and the world. Hydrothermal, there's about 10,000 quads worth. In the world, there's about 130,000. Um, and this table also gives uh, the available, um, again, estimated resources for geopressurized magma and hot dry rock. This figure, which is uh, from your book, illustrates regions in the United States with accessible geothermal resources. So geothermal resources are expressed in this figure in terms of end use capability. Resources above 100 degrees have the potential to be utilized for electric power, while resources below 100 degrees can be used for direct geothermal energy. So as you can tell, these, this area of the US has temperatures above 100 degrees for direct geothermal use. Um, and these areas are that are in gray are below 100 degrees. And then everything else in white is just suitable for geothermal heat pumps. Hydrothermal uh, sources have either hot water or steam available and represent the easiest geothermal sources to harvest. Dissolved solids and trained solid particles and non-condensable gases are problems with most geothermal sources. So the entrained solids are generally removed by centrifugal separators at the wellhead and filters are placed in the system to ensure that solid particles are removed. Non-condensable gases abound in some locations and pose many problems for geothermal systems. Many of the non-condensable gases form acids under wet conditions, necessitating the use of stainless steel or other expensive materials. Additionally, these gases pose environmental hazards if released onto the atmosphere. Hydrothermal sources are usually considered as either vapor dominant or liquid dominant, as I mentioned earlier. So here's an example of a vapor dominant hydrothermal, hydrothermal source. Um, again, these, these types of sources are the most uh, suitable for generation of electricity, but again, are the rarest of the geothermal, of geothermal energy. So here you have supply well coming, um, where you have the uh, steam coming, you have a centrifugal separator, and then this, as when the steam is separated, it goes into a turbine, <clears throat> excuse me, drives the turbine, goes back into a direct contact condenser, and um, goes through a process through a cooling tower to be re-injected into the ground. So the way that this uh, source can be, uh, the way that this can be looked at is we have here um, state one, right? We'll assume a, a saturated vapor coming out of the ground. Um, as it goes through the centrifugal process to the um, turbine, we see here a drop in pressure, right? So again, the pressure is going to be um, decreasing as it approaches state three. Then when it hits the turbine, it's going to go through a turbine process um, to extract work, and then it'll come out of the turbine to state four. This is the basic part of the process that produces power. So look at this example problem from your book. Both the, the problem reads, a vapor dominated geothermal system is supplied with saturated steam at three megapascals. The steam enters the turbine at 0.5 megapascals and exits at 15 kilopascals. The turbine isotropic efficiency is 82% and the electrical generator is 90% efficient. If reinjection occurs at the cooling tower, Analyze the system performance, basically the thermal efficiency and the heat rate. What flow rate of steam is required for a power generation of 10 megawatts? So um, you guys are feel free to go ahead and use ease. Uh, there should be some instructions available to you on um, how to get ease to start working. So if you want to go ahead and follow, uh, um, go ahead and get that ready to use. You'll need it for this chapter as well as um, the chapter on, uh, I believe on ocean energy EEs could be also useful, but definitely for this chapter. Okay, let's go ahead and start this. So we have at state one, 
we have um, basically steam at a or a saturated steam. So you have a pressure of three megapascals and a quality of one. All right, if we were to look at that, that would give us an enthalpy of 2,804 kilojoules per kilogram. Just for reference sake, if we were to go look at the temperature, that would basically be a temperature 234 degrees Celsius. Now, as this process goes through um, the centrifugal separator, process, the process from state one to two and then to three is often referred to as an isenthalpic process. It's an expansion, an isenthalpic expansion process, similar to um, an expansion valve for refrigeration systems. So again, we're going to assume an isenthalpic expansion from states one to three. So once we hit state three, the enthalpy is going to stay the same. So 2,804 kilojoules per kilogram. Now it's telling us that the once the steam gets to that point, it enters the compressor at a pressure at state three, I'm, I'm sorry, not the compressor, the turbine of um, 0.5 megapascals. So at that point, uh, that's how it's entering the turbine. And what we can do now is a turbine analysis, right? Knowing the efficiency of the turbine, we can go ahead and we can figure out what the actual work of the turbine is. Um, so if we were to do that, right, we would first need to look at the entropy. So just for reference sake, I want to note that if you look at the temperature at state three, you notice the temperature decreased to 177 or 176.7 degrees Celsius. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take the entropy. In this case, it would be 6.945 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And then what we can do is our turbine, anal a turbine efficiency is given to us of um, 0.82. And that has to equal the enthalpy going in minus the actual enthalpy coming out divided by the enthalpy going in, divided by the isentropic enthalpy going out. And again, that's the actual work over what I'll call the isentropic work. So the isentropic, or the isentropic state coming out, we have the pressure at 15 kilopascals, the entropy being the same. That gives us just exiting quality is not asking it for us. I just wanted to go ahead and look at that. The exiting quality of 0.85, the isentropic case. H4 isentropic would be 2,251 kilojoules per kilogram. So that would give us an isentropic work, H3 minus H4S, of 554 kilojoules per kilogram. And then the actual work coming out of the turbine would be the efficiency times the isentropic work. I have 454 kilojoules per kilogram, right? That's the specific work coming out of the turbine. Now the problem, at, problem statement is asking, one of the things they're asking is, what would be the flow rate of steam for the system required for a power generation of um, 10 megawatts? Well, if we were to go ahead and do that math, we would get that the actual work rate would equal the mass flow rate times the specific work rate. All right, so if we were to go ahead and solve for that, we would get our um, 10,000 or 10 megawatts divided by our 454 kilojoules per kilogram. That would give us a necessary mass flow rate of 24.5 kilograms per second. So that's the required um, mass flow rate. The other thing it's asking us for is the efficiency. So let me go over real quick how to quantify the efficiency of this particular geothermal plant. What we're going to do is we're going to look at 
the work of the turbine, right? So the efficiency would be what we um, want out of the system versus what we have to put into the system. So I'll look at the enthalpy difference between the injection well and the supply well as the denominator and the work of the turbine as the numerator. So we would get that the efficiency would be quantified as our work over the enthalpy difference between the supply well and the injection well. So if we, um, we're going to go ahead and make an assumption here. We'll make the assumption that the water is rejected back to the earth at 20 degrees C. That would give us an enthalpy of 84 kilojoules per kilogram. Right, so if we were to actually plug in our math here, 454 kilojoules per kilogram for the specific work of the um, turbine, H1 from the prior slide, H7 from here, we would get an overall efficiency of 15%. So again, that ex this example problem illustrates uh, the vapor-dominant geothermal system.